Hi everyone, uh, welcome to this week's Bee Biosecurity Talk. My name's Rebecca, you should know me by now. I'm the Bee Biosecurity Officer for Queensland. Tonight, we also have a couple of people helping us out. We have uh, Susie, who is helping with the technical side of stuff, along with Kelly. And we also have Hamish, who's uh, one of our APR officers here in Queensland, and he is going to help me out with the question side of things. So uh, if we can uh, head over to the slides, tonight's uh, talk is the first in our second series. Now, if you missed any of the first series, we're going to have those links up in the question and answer section. And we'll also have the links to the remaining remainder of the uh, talks in this series. So tonight we're going to talk about management of ants, wax moth and hive beetles. Um, and the following talks every second Tuesday night uh, at seven o'clock are going to be on note taking and record keeping for beekeepers. Now, this is a really important one for many beekeepers and I know often people struggle a bit about what they should write down and how they should record stuff. So that will be a, a really good one. Uh, then we've got a general one, um, which has been a big request from a lot of people, and that's to focus on good hive husbandry practices and just some really uh, solid bee basics to get people making sure they've got strong hives. Then uh, in line with uh, spring coming along, we're gonna be talking about getting your hive ready for spring. And I'll also talk a little bit about some of the other seasonal things that you might need to do on your beehive. So that's one to get you thinking about what you should be doing at different times of the year. But tonight we're gonna to be talking about these nasty little guys, ants, wax moth and hive beetle. Now many beekeepers will, ex almost all of them probably, will experience at least one of these pests in their hive. Now often they're a fairly minor pest, they might just be a bit of a nuisance, but they can all um, result in some pretty significant damage and they can even cause the hive collapse under the right circumstances. So it's important that they're all managed effectively. Now, all of these guys are kind of fitting into the scavenger section into your hive. So they're um, coming in to steal stuff from your bees. And when you're looking for scavengers, it's important to regularly inspect your hive, but to look also around your hive for any signs of them. Look underneath the lid, look in the honey supers, right throughout the brood box, and also have a look at the integrity of your hive. So look at the, the wooden structures and make sure that they're not um, degrading, coming apart, any bits broken, and they're not um, got these pests hiding in them. And also make sure you think about any bits uh, that are stored. So stored frames or stored hive components. Because these guys, um, these pests aren't necessarily focusing on uh, being a, a disease of your bees, or they're not a, a parasite that's directly attached. They're really after what the bees are making. They're also interested in any of those components, so the honey, the wax, even some of the dead bodies of the bees and that type of thing. They're all um, keen on getting to those. So also boxes that don't have live bees in them will attract these scavenger pests. So let's start by talking about one of my least favourite pests, and that is hive beetle. Now, to detect hive beetle, regularly do thorough inspection throughout your box. Now, both of your boxes, your super and your brood boxes. Now, once you lift the lid on your super, you'll find that you're likely to see the beetles straight away. They'll be there, and then they'll run away, scuttle and hide in the crevices and in the cells. So you've got to be pretty quick to see them when you open the hive up. And so if you open them and you fool around and then look around later on, you might miss these guys. Have a look too um, in the brood and the honey frames for signs of larvae. So you might see the beetle or you might see their little larvae. And also have a look at the honey. This is often one of the first signs that you've got a, a nasty infection or infestation of hive beetle is that will make your honey smell and taste really fermented. So it's a very, very unpleasant kind of um, ferment. It's not like you would a nice ferment like a mead. It's more of a, a honey gone off type smell. It'll also make your honey quite liquidy and kind of slimy. So it'll make the frames look like they've got some nasty slime on them. So keep an eye out for those signs. Now the beetles themselves, there's two different types of hive beetle small hive beetle and large hive beetle. And that's really how you tell the two apart. Small hive beetle is smaller than your bees, 
so around five to seven millimetres long. And the large hive beetle is much larger than your bees, so 20 to 23 millimetres long, so quite a big size difference. So if you see the beetles and they're smaller than your bees, you've got small hive beetle, larger than your bees, large hive beetle. You might also see some other types of beetles in your hive from time to time. So at the top here, you can see we've got some examples of different sizes of small hive beetle because they can vary a bit. In the middle, there are um, some images of native hive beetles. And these from time to time can also be found in your European honeybees, but they tend to have more, more of an impact on your native uh, bees. And at the bottom is a flower at chafer beetle. And these from time to time have also been found in beehives. They're not, to thought to, they're not thought to be a major pest, but you may come across them. And unlike the other beetles, you can see they've got quite um, a lot of spines on their legs. And that's, I think, one of the easiest ways to tell them apart. Let's start by talking about large hive beetle. It's actually exotic in Australia. So we don't have these guys here yet. And so if you do come across a large hive beetle that's bigger than your bees, give us a call, either the exotic plant pest hotline or the DAF hotline. If you can catch the beetle and keep it in a jar, that's fantastic. Otherwise, if you can just keep your hive uh, closed up and sealed up until we can get there and look for that beetle, that would be really great because we need to get a sample so that we can verify what species it is and make sure that it's um, a, a large hive beetle or if it, see if it's something else. So if you see a large hive beetle, this is a notifiable pest and you need to let us know about it. Small hive beetle, on the other hand, is not a notifiable pest. Um, it was previously in Queensland, but it's not anymore. But it is important that you keep on top of it because it will have a big impact on your hive if it gets out of control. So you might see something a little bit like this, which is the larvae of the small hive beetle. You can see this is quite a heavy infestation, lots of larvae. The honeycomb looks like it's been kind of gooey and degraded and a bit destroyed. So that's a pretty serious type of infection. You might also just see the larvae. So the two different types of larvae that you might see that are not bee larvae in your hive, a small hive beetle and wax moth larvae. Now small hive beetle tend to have a row, they have a row of spines along their back, whereas the wax moths don't have that, they've got smooth shiny along their back. The small hive beetle will tunnel throughout all the frames. So they'll tunnel through the honey frames as well as your brood frames, while the wax moth larvae will only go through fresh honey frames. They won't go through the brood frames. So if you're only seeing that damage in the brood, more likely to be a wax moth. They also have a little bit of difference in their leg structure. So both of them have kind of very undeveloped little legs along the length of their body, but the wax moth have a very distinct three sets of legs at the front of their body. And so that's uh, one of the key differences there you can tell. Um, you can also see they're often a little bit slightly different in body colour, but that's generally not a diagnostic uh, feature. You really have to look for that row of spines as well as the, the set of legs. Now small hive beetle scavengers and it lays their eggs in the hive. Those eggs hatch and the larvae tend to do the damage as they eat through the hive. Initially, when they first arrived in Australia, we thought they probably would have fairly minimal effects, but under some conditions, we found that they can cause hives to collapse and they can make just a big mess in your hive. They can mean that a lot of your honey might be unusable. So there are the kind of pests that you wanna keep on top of. And the key thing about the honey and the destruction of the honey is that it's not so much the beetle itself that's causing the damage, it's a, a yeast that they carry with them, that they spread, comes out in their feces throughout the hive that causes that sliminess and that contamination and the fermentation of the honey. So even after the beetles are gone, that uh, fermentation can continue if the hive beetles spread that yeast through your hive. So how do these guys spread? How do they get around? Well, the biggest uh, difficulty with this one is that they can move quite long distances as adult beetles. So the adult beetles can fly up to 15 kilometres in search of a hive. They get attracted to the smell of the hive, that sweet honey smell. They come into your hive, they'll lay their eggs in uh, capped brood cells or other small crevices in your hive. And then once the eggs hatch, those larvae will burrow through the comb 
eating eggs, pollen, honey, anything they can find. Uh, again, as they're going through, they're spreading that yeast that causes the damage to the honey and the fermentation in their feces. And they can be spread to new locations, either through moving the hive or hive components, so switching out frames or, or just moving hives long distances, but they can also move on their own. So once those larvae are ready to pupate, they'll leave the hive, so they'll wriggle out, they'll go into the soil, they'll pupate, turn into adults, and those adults then can fly that long distance. So they can get around pretty well on their own, unfortunately. So how do we prevent and manage small hive beetle? So the key thing here is to make sure that your hives have small beetle traps. And you've got two main options. You can use chemical traps or non-chemical traps. Now, chemical traps contain uh, the uh, component fipronol, uh, which is an insecticide. And it's really important when it comes to your chemical traps that these are only placed in the very bottom of the brood box, nowhere above that. And that's because if the chemicals out of these traps leak, um, where they get wet or damaged, they might then contaminate both your honey or your bees and cause the death of the bees or make the honey um, unusable. So make sure those fipronol traps are only in the very bottom. Now, the other uh, option you have are non-chemical traps, and these contain either cooking oil or diatomaceous earth. And they can be placed really anywhere in the hive. You uh, put them between the frames so that the little well goes down between the frames and the black piece at the top sits along the, the top of the frames. You can get these plastic ones, I'm going to show you in just a minute, um, that have a really single use. Um, I've found that you can kind of empty them out again and use them again, um, but you can also get reusable ones. So your uh, little traps that are non-chemical, if you can see that there, you can see it has a, a little well at the bottom where you put your oil or your diatomaceous earth and a little vent on the top where the bees, beetles get in. Whereas your chemical traps just look little like a little black box. Now with your uh, cooking oil or diatomaceous earth, uh, if you're moving your hive, make sure that you remove those traps first because if the oil or the, or the diatomaceous earth spills in the hive, it's going to have the same effect on the beetles as your bees, is it's going to kill them. So that's no good. Uh, when you're filling um, with oil, it's important to have a, uh, a, be very careful about what type of oil you use. Uh, the best kind is generally canola oil. You really want to avoid any mixed oil that you're not sure what's in it or any oil that contains peanuts or peanut oil. And that's because it's been found that uh, anything containing peanut oil in those traps can make its way into the honey and cause people with peanut allergies to react. So steer away from peanut oil. Uh, in many areas, they also you also find that uh, olive oil might get a little bit hard and clumpy, and so it can uh, often be not as effective either. Now, I find for a lot of areas uh, in Queensland where it's quite humid, the oil is much better than diatomaceous earth, and that's just because the diatomaceous earth can get quite um, uh, lumpy and uh, quite thick in that humid weather and does not work quite as effectively. Now, finally, if you are really struggling with hive beetle, you can treat the soil around the hive. Uh, you need to, there's only really one chemical that is registered for doing that, and that's 500 grams per litre per methrin. Uh, make sure that if you do go down this path, that you only apply it really late in the evening um, after those bees have all gone to bed, and make sure that, ooh, sorry, that the soil is quite wet in your application. Apply it around a 60 centimetre area around the hive and you'll need to continue to follow up every kind of 30 days. Now, this isn't going to impact on the uh, larvae or beetles that are in your hive at the moment. It's only going to impact on those ones that are going to come out and pupate in the soil. So it will take quite some time to have an, uh, have an impact on your hive. Now, another thing that you can do to be effective is to put your hives in a sunny location. This is important for controlling actually quite a lot of pests and diseases, and that's because uh, the pests tend to do less well in wet 
and uh, cooler areas and the bees tend to do much better. And so this gives your bees a bit of that advantage. Now, another thing, if possible, um, is to place your hives on hard clay soil rather than on soft sandy soil. Now, if you remember back to when I just talked about the life cycle and how the uh, larvae will come out of the hive and they'll pupate in the soil. If the soil underneath that hive is really hard and it's really hard for those uh, larvae to get into the soil, it means they'll have a difficult time pupating and they might get eaten by birds or just die of exposure before they get into the soil and pupate. And so if it's on the, uh, that hard clay soil, you reduce the number of beetles that are going to be coming back into your hive after they've pupated. So it can be a fairly effective way to just keep the numbers of beetles down. They're not always possible, I know. Often you're restricted where you can put your hives, but if you can move them around, that can help. Now, once uh, you've taken components out of your hive, if you're storing boxes or you're storing frames, there's a few things that you can do to minimise the chances of getting uh, infestations of small hive beetle. Uh, if you can extract your honey as soon as possible after you have taken it out of the hive, this will reduce the chances that the eggs will hatch and you'll have impacts on that um, honey that's not extracted. So the quicker you can get it out, the more likely it's gonna be safe and away from those hive beetle larvae. Uh, if you've got a st store frames, if you can store them below 10 degrees Celsius, this will stop the life cycle continuing, so it'll reduce the number of small hive beetles in there. Generally, there aren't any really effective chemical treatments and any chemicals that are out there tend to lead more to contamination of the frames, so steer away from those. Uh, if you need to kill the eggs or the larvae on any of your equipment or your hive components, Store them at below negative 13 degrees Celsius for at least six hours, and that should take care of that. So keep in mind, though, if you're going to store things, if you put them at that low temperature for six hours and you take them out, you'll have killed anything on there, but you won't prevent new things from coming in. So make sure that it's in an area that's going to be away um, from pests or, or sealed up from pests, and keep an eye on it to make sure that you don't have those larvae, uh, sorry, those adults come in and start laying eggs on your frames. Now, while you're doing any type of management around small hive beetle, it's really important to make sure that you're protecting yourself. So the yeast that we talked about before that causes the fermentation has been known to make some people sick. And so it's important that you discard any contaminated honey. Um, don't feed it to other bees. Don't use it for other things. Don't put it on your skin or eat it. Um, it can cause rashes and it can make people sick. Um, anyone with a weakened immune system should uh, not clean out hives that are affected by small hive beetle for that very reason that the yeast um, might cause an infection. And if you're cleaning out your hives um, with small hive beetle, uh, try and wear gloves and a face mask. And if you've got any exposed skin, put a waterproof dressing over it. And once you're finished, make sure that you shower immediately and put on some clean clothes. So you yeast. So let's move uh, away from small hive beetle and on to wax moth. So if you're looking for wax moth, again, you just want to look through all the components of the hive up in the lid, in the brood box and in the super. See if you can see any moths or any larvae. So again, think back. If you find some larvae, you can tell the difference between the larvae from small hive beetle or wax moth by those row of spines along their back and how many legs they've got. Um, you might also see signs of wax moth through lines in the uh, brood that are uncapped. So if you see the photo at the bottom there, you'll see that you've got these kind of straight lines of uncapped brood that seem kind of out of place and odd. And this is where the wax moth has kind of gone through and impacted on those larvae. So that can be another indicator that they're in your hive. If it's an advanced uh, infection, you'll notice that they'll start to have these kind of gross looking uh, cobwebs or cocoons that can go all over your frames. And so that's a really obvious one if you get those wispy spider web type material in your, on your frames that you've got wax moth. There are two species of wax moth, lesser and uh, greater wax moth, and they can be active in both uh, 
active hives and in stored or um, inactive hives, but they tend to not be very common in strong active hives. So it's usually only the weak ones that tend to have wax moth in there. They tend to also generally do fairly minor damage in active hives. It, the main damage is often caused when you've got stored frames. So the wax moth spreads very similar um, to the beetle in that it can fly fairly long distances from one hive to the next. So once that adult at night time will fly into a new hive, um, you often don't ever see the moths because they tend to do these quick flights at night and, night and then you won't see them again. But they'll go into the hive and lay their eggs on the comb. Once the eggs have hatched, the larvae will burrow through the comb and as they do so, they'll damage the brood. And they tend to get moved around when you move your hives long distances. If you're moving uh, components from one hive to another, so if you're switching out frames, you can move them. Um, they can also uh, crawl fairly short distances uh, to get to a new hive. And so once they get to the new hive, they can set up shop there. Or once they've pupated, they will then, as adult moths, fly to their next hive. So they can spread pretty long distances um, on their own steam. So what can we do to manage wax moth? Well, the key thing for active hives is again to have good bee husbandry. So leaving your bees with at least three quarters of a box of honey for autumn and winter, feeding them if they are in very poor condition, reducing the number of frames, particularly in winter, uh, requeening regularly, so every three to four years, replacing your brood comb every uh, three to four years as well, and removing any effective combs. And also check all the wood in your hive. So any of those uh, bits of wood that have kind of split off or have been broken, that's where the wax moths like to get in and lay their eggs. And so if you can repair or replace any split wood, that'll also minimise the impact on active hives. In stored frames, there's a few different things that you can do to get rid of or, or to minimise your wax moth. The key uh, effective one is to store it at a low temperature, so below seven degrees Celsius for at least three hours. Or you can go the other way and you can store it above 46 degrees Celsius for at least five hours. Now, this is a tricky one because you don't want to go too high. You don't want to go in a temperature higher than 50 degrees because then you start to lose the integrity of the wax and it'll start to melt. So it has to be fairly specific. So most of the time it's much safer to go to that lower temperature rather than trying to get that higher one just right. Now also if you're storing your comb, one way you can keep wax moth out is to make sure it's well ventilated and well lit. So having that airflow come through the frames and having lots of light, that all, um, it really makes the wax moth think, oh, this isn't a good place for me to live. And so they don't set up shop there. So that can help quite a bit. Now you can use a chemical treatment um, when you're storing frames or hives uh, to prevent wax moth. I don't highly recommend it just because it can be very dangerous and it can, um, you know, if not done properly, it can leave residues in your hive. Uh, the chemical treatment is um, aluminium phosphide pellets and these produce a fairly nasty gas. So in order to use these pellets, you need to keep your frame somewhere where they're going to be in a sealed position and you're also going to seal, have to seal them up with black plastic so that none of the gas is going to be able to leak out. And you also have to do this somewhere that you're not going to be working or, or living because you don't want to risk um, poison from the gas if it does leak. Uh, when you're putting the pellets in, they shouldn't touch each other for them to be effective. And you really only need most of the time one pellet in each uh, uh, section that you have sealed off. The treatment tends to take about three to five days to be effective. Um, and it also needs to be done when um, the conditions are just right. So the temperature needs to be greater than 15 degrees Celsius, but the humidity needs to be less than 25%. And in many areas in Queensland, that can be um, difficult if you're living particularly in the subtropics and subtropics, getting that humidity right. So if you, unless you're really desperate and you're not, you know, you've got to work with large uh, numbers of hives, I'd suggest try for some of these other treatments like freezing or uh, keeping the, the temperature of the uh, frames much at the 46 degrees Celsius rather than going for the chemical one, which can have some nasty side effects. 
So let's move from uh, wax moss and move on to ants. Now, ants, again, um, the best way to find them is to regularly look in your hives. Um, also check around your hive. So the first time I noticed ants coming into my hive, I noticed it because they got a little trail from the um, area where I uh, went into where my hives were, right up to the leg of my hive and up into the hive. So I could see their little trails going in there. Uh, so check both inside the, the um, hive and around the hive, particularly if you're just about to set up a hive. Uh, you know, if you've got a new hive, have a look at the area really carefully for ants' nests before you put your hive down there. If you can avoid uh, putting your hive near an ants' nest, it'll avoid a lot of stress later on. There are a whole range of different ants that you might find inside your hive. Um, some of the uh, more common ones are meat ants, uh, small black ants, coastal brown ants, sugar ants, green tree ants, and you may possibly even see fire ants. Now they might set up a nest in your hive or they might just simply be robbing honey or wax from your hive. I want to talk just a little bit about fire ants because it's quite an important one for Queensland. Fire ants have been found in the Brisbane, Logan, Ipswich, Redlands, scenic rim areas, and there are also some in, uh, isolated infestations in both the Lockyer Valley and the northern Gold Coast, and they're also uh, further north around Gladstone. Now, fire ant uh, areas are uh, particularly zoned, uh, and in these areas or zones, there is restricted movement of materials to try and prevent the spread of uh, fire ants. So if you live in an area that is in a fire ant zone, it's really important that you follow those rules. And if you're not sure, uh, give the Red Imported Fire Ant Eradication Program a call. Um, if you also give them a call if you think you see fire ants in your hive or around your hive or in your backyard. Um, the tricky little ants to ID because they vary quite a lot in their size. So they can be anything from two to six millimeters long. So quite a big difference in their size. They're kind of a coppery brown color. Uh, and often one of the key ways that people identify them is they're quite aggressive ants. So nasty and they have a really bad, really serious bite. So very unpleasant. So make sure that um, before you move a hive, if you're in an area with uh, red fire, with uh, red imported fire ants, that you give the fire ant people a call and they may have to come and inspect your hive before you move it. Uh, other ants, uh, there are a few different things that you can do to prevent them coming in or to manage them once they do come in. None of them, unfortunately, are very foolproof and um, often people really struggle to get rid of ants because there's no really great solution. One of the most common things that people do is to grease the leg of their legs of their hives. So if your hive's on a stand, put a thick layer of Vaseline is probably the best thing around those legs and that'll um, make it difficult for the ants to come up those legs. Um, another thing that people sometimes put on the legs of the hive is a, a, a substance called Tanglefoot. Now Tanglefoot, although it's quite effective in catching ants and not letting them up, it's also really messy and can stick, it sticks to everything. So um, think carefully before going down that route um, and, and have a go with Vaseline first. Another way that you can try and minimise the impact of ants is to place the legs of your hive in dishes, uh, small dishes of oil. And that oil means that the ants can't get across and up the legs of the hive. Make sure though that both with the greasing of the legs of the hive and the oil, that after any rain, you apply those treatments again and check them because rain will dilute the oil and it'll wash off um, the grease and will make it less effective. So they're the kind of thing that needs to be constantly checked and, and topped up. Now, another one that um, people have uh, been spooking about, and I actually have tried it myself and haven't had luck, and it, it depends a bit, I think, on what ants are in the area and what the local circumstances are. But uh, sprinkling diatomaceous earth or cinnamon around the legs of the hive can also be effective. Again, depends, I think, a bit on the environment and the ant. So have a go at that one. Uh, to try and stop ants being attracted the, to the area, try not to feed out in the open. So if you've got to feed your bees, feed inside the hive rather than a, an outside hive. And that'll just stop those ants starting to come in and be attracted to the area.
Now for all of these different treatments, if you keep the grass and the plants around your hive short, it will stop the bee, the, sorry, the ants having uh, additional ways to get into the hive. So if things are touching the hive or touching the legs of the hive, those are all routes that those ants can use to get in there. So they can bypass anything that you've put on the legs of the hive or around the legs of the hive. So keep that grass and any plants short. Um, the chemicals that will kill ants, are also going to kill bees. So ants and bees are very similar uh, in their biology. And so keep that in mind if you go and treat ants in the local area, so the local mans of ants, and those ants then head off into your beehive with some of the chemical on them, they'll take that chemical back to your beehive. So you do need to be very careful if you're killing ants around your hive with other treatments that those ants aren't in a, a, a sort of situation or a circumstance where they can get back into your hive because they might take those chemicals with them. So here's just a couple of images of um, what you can do. Uh, first ones are very much homemade, a couple of buckets with some oil in it and the legs of your hive are put in those buckets. And at the bottom there's a, a commercial uh, beehive uh, stand which has got little um, wells in there for oil and to stop the ants getting in and also a cover over the top to stop water getting into the oil and diluting it. So you can get a range of different um, methods or, or, or stands that will try and have little oil wells included in them to try and prevent ants coming up. Now, for all of the species that we've, or the pests that we've talked about tonight, there are often a lot of options that people um, talk about, uh, have tried, um, and they may or may not be effective, but I wanted to just mention them tonight. So a lot of uh, beekeeping, particularly websites, mention planting mint around the hive to prevent um, ants and wax moths. Now, it's not going to hurt, um, but I couldn't find any evidence to suggest that it was particularly effective or that they've shown that it was effective. But again, if you want to give it a try, it's not going to have a, an impact as long as you keep it away from the direct um, legs of the hive and the hive box itself. One that I have um, seen, had many people tell me is quite effective for them, is to let chickens live around your hive, at least for part of the time if you've got a small hive beetle problem. Uh, chickens love small hive beetle larvae and they will um, gobble them down as soon as they uh, come out of the, the hive. And so instead of stopping them from getting into the soil by having hard packed soil, you might get a chicken to eat those little larvae. And so th that may be quite effective. Um, there's also often people mention uh, creating their own bottle traps where they get a, a soft drink bottle, they add into it sugar, vinegar, and some kind of um, old fruit like a banana skin or something to attract the, the um, wax moth uh, or the small hive beetles into those areas. They hang those traps not really close to the hive, but in the vicinity to try and draw those um, wax moth and small hive beetle into that area. Now, there's been some studies that have had Bit mixed results. So in some cases, they, they do attract those wax moth and small hive beetle to the trap, but they also attract them into the general area as well. And so you may, in some cases, end up with more of these wax moth and small hive beetle coming into your hive just because they've been attracted to the local area by your trap. So again, have a bit of caution if you uh, want to experiment with that. And finally, insect zappers. Um, some people suggest around uh, wax moth storage to use these, but they tend to have not shown to be particularly effective in preventing the wax moth, particularly um, as generally it's the larvae doing the damage and often those larvae or those eggs are already there when the um, frames go into storage. So um, overall, uh, if you need any more information or advice, great places to go to look, of course, are the Australian Honey Bee Industry Biosecurity Code of Practice, um, the Biosecurity Manual for Beekeepers, the Bee Aware website has great information as well. And I've got some fantastic news about the Biosecurity for Bees online training course. This is now free for all beekeepers, so you don't need a token and there's no fee for hobby beekeepers. Um, so go ahead, have a go at that one, and that um, will reinforce some of these uh, things that we've been talking about to this evening. 
of course, if you're unsure or you want further advice, you can always call me or drop me an email and um, I'm more than happy to have a chat to you about managing any of these pests. So let's move on now to our question and answer. Okay, what have we got here first up today? Great question I'm going to uh, start with from Lindsay. Will a strong bee population keep pest numbers low? Yes, is the answer most of the time. Um, of course, there's always a time when environmental condition, conditions might lead to having a, a, an explosion of some of these pests, but the best um, defence is usually keeping those bee keeping, keeping the hive numbers high and your colonies really strong. Here's a, a question, uh, I'm going to throw this one to you Hamish. Are there any benefits in preventing hive beetle with a flow hive as you don't need to remove the frames to extract honey? Oh, thanks Rebecca. Um, oh, um, I, I guess it's hard for me to answer that one because I don't have a lot of experience with the flow hives in that that situation but um, I think the take home rule is um, the experience of beekeepers is um, the more you um, open and expose the hive uh, and more disruption to the hive the more uh, the small hive beetle will get a, um, a hold or a, a free range I suppose so so in theory perhaps that could help uh, because the flow hive is less disturbed and um, it's more intact. So um, could be on the right path there. So I guess that's all I'd, I'd say in that, that one. Thanks, Hamish. But don't forget um, to continue to inspect your hive. I know um, you don't need to disturb it to extract it, but make sure you keep looking in there. Otherwise, you might miss the, the hive beetle be before it's at a point where uh, gets to the point where you're able to do something to, to control it. So um, even though you're not pulling apart to extract, do uh, inspect regularly. I've got a great question here from Rob. Um, how far around the hives do you spread the diatomaceous earth and can it be placed inside the hives? So you can place it inside the hives in, in your trap, but don't just spread it willy nilly loose inside your hives. And that's because um, it'll do the same thing to your bees as it does to the ants. So I think diatomaceous earth, what it does is it gets into the, um, the joints of the insect and it works away at those and, and means that it, they can't move very well anymore. Is that right, Hamish? Yeah, that's right, uh, Rebecca. You're on the right track there. That's, um, that's right. Yeah, so you don't want um, all the bees being exposed to it. You want to just make sure that um, the the beetles are exposed to it and if you're putting it around the legs of your hive you want a good oh, sorry I've got a bend over with you know a, a reasonable sort of uh width around it probably I don't know 10 centimeters or so just enough that you can sign kind of anything that's going to be walking up to the legs of your hive to get in will get a bit of it on their legs um I've got a question here from Bob and um, I'm going to answer this one. Are the same set of pests relevant to native bees? Now this is a good question and I've been trying to track sit down someone to uh, this week who might uh, do a talk with me on native bees. I haven't had a response yet but I'm hoping to talk about that in the next series. Uh, some of these pests will impact on, on native bees. Um, hive beetle, as we talked about, hive beetle will go into native bee nests. Um, particularly as native hive beetles and can cause the collapse of a native bee um, hive beetle. Hamish, do you know anything about wax moths um, or ants getting into native hives? Uh, no, Rebecca, I don't know about wax moths. Um, I I haven't heard that they are. There are there are other pest species that specifically um, related to native bees, but um, uh, the wax moth hasn't come up as one, so so no, I don't don't know of any instances of it, but certainly the the small hive beetle will um will be a problem. Yeah, yeah. 
Now, here's a really difficult question. It's a little bit of a how long's the piece of string is uh, how many small hive beetle are too many small hive beetle? Now, most people will find when they open their hive, they'll have one or two scuttle away. Um, how many is too many is when you start to see symptoms, particularly on your frames of honey. You start to see sliming out. That's a really not a good sign. Um, they'll be coming in all the time trying to get into your hive. Most of the time your bees will be able to get on top of them, grab them and chuck them out. It's only when your bee hive starts to get weak that we tend to end up seeing them um, being able to lay their eggs in there and we start to get larvae. So if you've got eggs or larvae being laid in the honey, that's kind of when you've got too many. Um, but any is really too many in terms of being able to manage them. So I always put high, um, small beetle traps in my hives all the time. I don't wait for there to be a problem, particularly, you know, the ones with oil or diatomaceous earth doesn't hurt to have them in all of the time. Um, I'm going to hand this next one over to you, Hamish, and I missed it on the way down. Um, wax moth, how long does the moth live and um, does it only lay eggs in the spring? Oh, thanks, Rebecca. Um, look, I'm sorry, I don't know how long each moth lives for. I can't remember, but um, but they, you know, follow the life cycle. Sorry, Hamish. Oh, sorry, Rebecca. Uh, yeah. Um, so they have a life cycle. So you know, their their main objective is to um, to enter the beehive and and lay eggs for them to to hatch into to grubs, and so. Um, uh, what was the next part of the question where the um, uh, uh, around in the spring and I think I think oh, so the spring sorry yes yeah the spring um, yeah look I think um, the the warmer times of the, the year are going to be um, the peak time so yes in spring uh, but certainly right through the summer period yeah the only in Queensland, um, you know, in the southern part of the state, um, being a little bit cooler, we have a little reprieve, but um, anything north, um, you know, it's open season really all year round for um, for these pests that, that like the um, tropical and subtropical climates. Yeah, unfortunately up north, it's, there's no, no break, is there? <laughs> um, now the next question, next uh, one I've got here is uh, more of a, a helpful statement. Um, uh, suggestion, I guess, uh, for trying to keep ants out of hives. Um, a small metal disc um, put on boat ropes um, used to stop rats and mice running up. If you put them on your legs and grease them underneath, that can be effective. And that sounds to me like probably a good solution. Any um, Thing that's going to have a bit of grease on it that's going to stop them getting through and if it's very uh sh you know shiny very slippery that'll help as well and you can buy hives that have them um built into the legs where there's like a, a curved over disc that you put grease underneath so yep that's another sounds like a, a, a nice uh, cheap way to go about it is to find the the, the disc you put on rope boats so thanks for that suggestion um go down one more uh, okay here's a question from carol um we occasionally find geckos in the hive are they more likely to eat pests or the bees and i think they might be probably eating both what do you think hamish yeah i think that might be right rebecca um i guess um yeah having geckos in there is a common common finding and um yeah i guess um they they gobble both and i don't think that they're going to um consume numbers of bees if they are eating any bees to be um problematic um so i think it's something that shouldn't be too worried about but i think they'll just come and go um and it's probably a difficult one to control unless you're just taking them out um as you see them yeah yeah um, so a question here around uh, the treatment of small hive beetle uh, when you're spraying around permethrin around the hive, um, around the uh, dosage there, and it, um, I'm just checking it now, uh, 500 grams per litre, and you should be able to find those recommendations um, in the uh, list of 
chemicals that have been um, what's the word, uh, permitted or uh, allowed to be used for different purposes uh, in Queensland. And so you can look that up and, and it'll tell you what's um, available to treat a uh, small hive beetle. Uh, Rebecca, can I just make a comment there? Yep. Um, the dosage rate is one milliliter in one liter of water of the product, which is 500 grams per liter. So ah, it's a little bit yep. confusing. You need to find a um, the label that says that that product is 500 grams per liter, and then distill one milliliter of that into a, a liter of water. And the spraying is a little bit um, a misnomer in that you need to actually drench it in, you know, in a watering can um, into the soil. Yeah. Thanks, Hamish. That's a really good point. <laughs> Some of these things, you've got to get the concentration of the chemical right first, and then you also need to get the concentration that you're applying it at correct as well. So a bit of a, bit of a tricky two-step process. Um, good question here. How many uh, traps do you put in each hive for beetles? So if you're using the chemical, the fipronol one, Generally, people just put one in the bottom. That's usually sufficient. If you're using oil traps, I usually put two in the top and two, two in the super, two in the brood box. Three you might put. Any more than that's probably not going to be adding any to, anything too much to your to hives. If you're finding you're not really getting many beetles, take it back to just putting one in there. Um, so manage it a little bit depending on how many beetles you seem to be finding in those traps. Um, sorry, I'm just reading the next one. Okay, we've got a question here. Um, previous webinar, we mentioned a charge for commercial beekeepers. Um, well, hobby beekeepers are free. Um, why are there different uh, payments? for commercial and hobby beekeepers. So I'm not sure exactly what you're asking there, but I think you might be um, referring to registration fees. Um, and that's just because uh, when you're a commercial beekeeper, you're going to be making money off your um, hives. And so um, we tend to provide them with a bit more support uh, and that's why they need to be charged that's why they charge for uh, registration. Um, I'm not sure if that's your question. Let me know if that's not quite what you're um, asking there. Um, in terms of the um, bolt course, if that was your question, um, the bolt course is now free for all beekeepers. So those are the only things that there really are, are charges for. So um, hopefully that answers that one. Ah, another great uh, point here, and this is one I forgot to mention, and I'm glad someone brought it up. Um, Neil has said that uh, uses a chucks, uh, like a, a cloth, you know, the blue and white cloths uh, on his super to collect the small hive beetle and get rid of it. And that's also been found to be quite effective. They don't like those chucks cloths. They get all caught up in the little filaments on them. And so that can be a really uh, cheap, easy and, and, and really safe way to, to help control small hive beetle. Okay, I'm going to throw this next one to you, Hamish. This is from Lindsay. I have heard that small hive beetle can trick bees into feeding them. Is this true? Oh, thanks, Rebecca. Yes, um, that is true. Uh, what actually happens in the hive is um, the bees round up the small hive beetle in, and corral them into uh, little uh, waxed off areas to try and, um, uh, as a strategy to keep them at bay. Um, and whilst they're um, trapped in this um, corral, um, the small hive beetle has worked out a way to um, uh, stimulate the, the bee's um, antennae or face and it will um, start regurgitating some nectar and the, the beetles um, benefit from that. So um, it's an interesting um, observation by one of the researchers, um, bi biological researchers in, um, in small hive beetles. So, um, so that is a fact. Oh, they are insidious. That's really mean. <laughs> Just another reason you want to get them out of your hive. Wow. Um, see, I think we've run out of questions. So I want to thank everyone tonight. Really good questions. Um, they were really, really interesting. And hopefully you can go forth and um, keep those nasty pests out of your hive. 
uh, fortnight's time, I'll be back and we'll be talking about record keeping and note taking for beekeepers. Um, thanks and good night, everyone. <laughs>